What do the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us about the biblical text? It's important to note that among the scrolls we have at least fragments from each and every book of the Hebrew Bible, with the exception of the book of Esther. And that might be due to the fact that Esther is the only book in which the name of God is never mentioned. For that reason, the sect may have considered it unworthy of copying. We also have the entire book of Isaiah all 66 chapters, as well as a partial copy of the same text. Furthermore, enhanced carbon dating techniques allow us to arrive at very accurate conclusions based on as little as a square millimeter of parchment. And they now make it possible to conclusively place the great bulk of these biblical texts in the first two centuries BCE. The very existence of the scrolls opens a window on the text of the Bible that predates all other copies of the sacred books by more than a thousand years. Having said that, it's important to point out that older doesn't necessarily mean better. In fact, there are multiple mistakes and scribal errors in the Dead Sea Scrolls biblical texts. The so-called Masoretic text compiled by Jewish scribes in early medieval times is certainly superior. Moreover, we know that texts don't get better over time. They get worse as errors creep in but cannot be corrected since scribes were instructed to copy the text perfectly without changing a single letter, even if they suspected that it had been set down imperfectly. Yet the errors in the Dead Sea Scroll texts do not appear in the Masoretic text. This means that the Dead Sea Scrolls represent a separate family of biblical texts and that the Masoretic text evolved independently from some other textual line. Sometimes, however, the Dead Sea Scrolls present us with possibly better versions of the biblical narratives. For example, in Isaiah 6.3, the Masoretic text reads, Kadosh, 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 Hashem Tzvaot. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. In Dead Sea Scrolls Isaiah, we simply read, Kadosh, Kadosh, holy, holy. There is no third holy. Also, according to the Bible, the height of Goliath, the giant whom David felled with his slingshot, was an impossibly tall six cubits, which is equivalent to nine feet nine inches. That obviously looks like a tall tale. But according to a Dead Sea Scrolls fragment from the book of First Samuel, his height was four cubits and a span equivalent to about six feet, nine inches. That's still very tall, but by no means worthy of the Guinness Book of World Records. There are places in which the Dead Sea Scrolls agree with the Septuagint or Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible against the Masoretic text. An example is the book of Jeremiah, which is about one eighth shorter in the Septuagint. The scrolls appear to verify the shorter version of the biblical prophet. It now appears likely, though not provable, that roughly one-eighth of the book consists 
of embellishments added later. In one place, by contrast, the Dead Sea Scrolls preserve a passage which did not come down in the Masoretic text. In 1 Samuel 11, there is mention of the king of the Ammonites, Nahash, who made a peace treaty with the Israelites of Jabesh Gilead on condition that the right eye of each resident of the city be gouged out. Josephus records additional information beyond what is found in the Bible, saying that King Nahash had a habit of doing this to those who surrendered to him. Some of this additional material has now been found among the Qumran fragments of 1 Samuel, which seems to verify Josephus. One more example relates to Deuteronomy 32.8, where we read in the Masoretic text, Yatsev gvulot amim la mispar b'nei Yisrael. He fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. Most Greek manuscripts, including the Septuagint, read, Kata Arithmon Angelon Theu. According to the angels of God. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we read, Yetsev Gvulot Amim, La Mispar Bene Elohim. According to the sons of God, which conjures up the image of angels. This is most likely how the earliest texts read and why the Septuagint rendered it angels of God. The later rabbinic sages, however, did not want to emphasize the involvement of angels, which might lead to angel worship and contradict the essence of Israelite monotheism. So they changed the wording from sons of God to sons of Israel. It's also important to mention the long-held theory that the Hebrew Bible descended through three distinct textual traditions. An Egyptian family represented by the Greek Septuagint, a Palestinian family represented by what has come to be called the Samaritan Pentateuch, and a Babylonian family represented by the Masoretic text. There is evidence that all three families among the Dead Sea Scrolls are present, providing proof that the Babylonian and Egyptian traditions had arrived in the land of Israel and joined up with the Palestinian family well before the Common Era. An alternate theory, however, completely discounts the notion of three different types of biblical texts. It can be argued that there are no less than five groups of Qumran texts, texts written in special Qumranic practice, though with numerous errors, proto-Masoretic texts, pre-Samaritan texts, texts close to the Hebrew source for the Septuagint, and non-aligned texts exhibiting no consistent patterns of agreement or disagreement with the others. As expected, there is a wide disagreement among scholars regarding how the biblical text came about and how exactly the Dead Sea Scrolls contribute to our knowledge of its evolution. Nevertheless, thanks to the scrolls, we know much more than we ever have about what the Hebrew Bible looked like prior to its final canonized form. In the final analysis, what can we say about the incredible legacy of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the wealth of knowledge they provide regarding one of the most seminal periods in human history? Well, to find the real legacy of these people living on the edge of eternity, we have to look beyond the brief generations of their existence to the millennia which follow. For during the long centuries after Qumran's destruction, some very curious events take place. The wicked Kitim really are judged in the end. Anyone who has ever read Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire is well aware of what happens during those centuries. Every emperor is dethroned. 
The Senate is abandoned. The Colosseum and the circuses are emptied. The streets lie deserted. The center of the empire, the Forum, becomes a haunt of jackals. Every trace of the complex fabric of Roman life is slowly unraveled. And the once proud Roman citizenry becomes so utterly assimilated that today not a solitary trace of Roman blood or heritage can be discerned among all the human family. And whereas the Romans once designed to obliterate the Jewish people, today young Jewish children whose mother tongue is Hebrew sit in schoolrooms and study ancient Latin as a dead language. It is phenomenal. The Dead Sea sect, whether they were Essenes or some other group, have come and gone. But the Jewish people, like the scriptures they faithfully copied through the ages, live on. Certainly, the excavated ruins of Qumran and the nearby caves are a subtle reminder of the eternal resonance and power of the Hebrew scriptures. But we are also reminded of other things including the danger of exclusive sectarian movements and the error of militant fanaticism. Nevertheless, we appreciate the fact that the caves and the priceless treasure they contain have been preserved for the world in the very state in which they were hastily abandoned so long ago. The English poet Percy Bysshe Shelley might well have been writing of the ruin of Qumran when he penned these classic verses. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away.